As we have planned, we will start a new chapter in this and the next class, chapter 25. In the previous chapters, we saw how managers use cost behaviors to determine a company's break point and break even point to prepare the budgets and to evaluate performance. Well, in this chapter, we'll see how managers use their knowledge of cost behavior to make short-term business decisions. Short-term decisions including whether to make an order within special pricing or drop an unprofitable product. The decisions we discuss in this chapter pertain to short-term short-term business decisions, usually within one or one year or less. And in the next chapter, we will discuss long-term business decisions. Well, before we look at some type of short-term decisions in detail, let's consider a, a manager's decision-making process and the information that managers need to evaluate their opinions. So first of all, we need to know what is in relevant decisions? Uh, I mean, what is relevant information for short-term decisions? These slides, this slide illustrates how managers make decisions among alternative courses of actions. And as the managerial content, we would help with the third step to gather and analyze relevant information to compare alternatives. When managers use make decisions, they focus on information that is relevant to the decisions. Relevant information is accepted future data that differ from alternatives. And the relevant costs are those costs that are relevant to a particular decision. To illustrate, let's use a fictitious company Again, the smart touch learning as an example. For example, when the company, uh, let's assume the company is considering purchasing a new delivery truck and the company has two choices. I mean, two choices uh, regarding to the model of the trunk, the sales tax, and the insurance premium costs. These, these information are relevant because they are the cost that will incur in the future. And these costs have difference between each other, each alternative. So these costs are considered to be relevant information because they can affect the decision of which trunk to purchase. So in contrast, the irrelevant costs are those costs that do not affect the decision. 
because they are not in the future or do not differ among alternatives. For example, if the two trunk models have similar fuel efficiency and maintenance ratings, we do not expect the trunk operating cost to differ between those two alternatives because these future costs do not differ. So they do not affect the management's decisions. Or in other words, these information are considered to be irrelevant to the decision. Sunk cost. Some costs are the costs that were incurred in the past, in the past, and cannot be changed regardless of which future action is taken. Some costs are always irrelevant to business decisions. Well, this uh, this doesn't mean we cannot learn from the past decisions. Because, uh, you know, the managers should always consider the results of past decisions when making future decisions. But because some costs are already spent, those costs are not relevant to future decision making. For example, perhaps the smartest learning company wants to trade in its current trunk when the company buys the new trunk. So in this case, the amount that the company paid for the current trunk is a sunk cost. No decision making can alter the sunk cost spent in the past. And all companies can do now is to keep the current trunk traded uh, in or sell it for the best price that company can get. So here in this case, what is relevant is the amount that the company can receive if it sells the trunk in the future. Uh, let's Let's hear, suppose two dealerships. One dealership offers $8,000 trading values and another one offers $10,000 trading values. Because the amount differ and the transaction will take place in the future. So in this case, the trading cost, uh, I mean the trading value is relevant to the company's decision. And also the same principle applies to all situations. When we consider alternatives between short-term business decisions, we should only consider the relevant data. Well, relevant information doesn't have to has to be financial only for only financial information. Sometimes it could be non-financial information. The managers must always consider the potential quantitative and qualitative effects of their decisions. And the managers who ignore qualitative factors can make very serious effects.
For example, the city of Nottingham in England spends $1.6 million on two 15 solar powered parking meters. After seeing how well the parking meters work in countries along the seaside. But they didn't consider that the British skies are typically overcast. The result was that the meters didn't always work because of the lack of sunlight. So in this case, in this case, that city lost money because people parked for free when the meters are lack of sunlight, the power. Relevant qualitative information has the same characteristics as relevant financial information. The qualitative effects occurs in the future and differs between alternatives. So in this example, the amount of future sunshine required by the meters differed from different alternatives. A common approach to make short-term business decisions is called differential, differential, differential analysis. Well, in this approach, the emphasis is on difference in operating income between the alternative approaches. Differential analysis is always some, I mean, it is sometimes it is called incremental analysis, same thing. Instead of looking at the company's entire income statement under each decision alternatives, we just look at how operating income would differ under each alternative. If we use this, uh, this approach, we can leave out the irrelevant information. So in this chapter, we will introduce three types of short-term de uh, short decisions that the management wants to make to accept or deny regular and special pricing to drop whether to drop uh, whether or not to drop unprofitable products and whether or not to outsource or process on site. Well, in this class, we will see the first decision. And in the next class, we will see the rest. We start our discussion with decision making by looking at regular pricing decisions and special pricing decisions. Well, in the past, managers didn't consider pricing to be a short term decision. But product life cycle is getting shorter in most industries. Companies often sell products for only a few months before replacing them with an updated model, even if the updating is small. 
such as cell phones in the current period. In addition to that, we have a clothing, clothing industry. Always have had short, uh, a short product life cycle. And same thing applies to auto or housing industries. There are three basic questions that the managers must answer when they set regular prices for the product or services. One, what is the company's target profit? Two, how much will customers pay? Three, it Sorry. Three, is the company a price taker or price setter for this product or service? The answer to these questions are complex and ever changing. Stockholders expect the company to achieve certain profits. In addition to that, economic conditions, historical company earnings, industry raise competition, and new business development will also affect the level of profits that stockholders expect. Stockholders usually tie their profit expectations to amounts of assets invested in the company. For example, stockholders may expect a 10% annual return on investment. A company's stock price tends to decline if it doesn't meet the target profit. So managers must keep cost, must keep the cost low while generating enough avenue to meet the target profits expected. So this leads to the second question. That is, how much will customers pay? The managers cannot set, set price ab above what customers are willing to pay or otherwise the sales volume will decline the amount customers will pay depends on supply and demand you know which is influenced by competition products uniqueness uh, the effectiveness of marketing and some other general economic conditions. Well, to address the third question, whether a company is price taker or a price setter. Imagine a horizontal line with price taker at one end and price setter at the other end. A company falls somewhere along the line for each of its um, products and services. The companies are price taker when they have little or no control over the prices of their products or services and take the price set by the market. This occurs when their products or services are not unique. 
and when the competition is intense. Some examples include the milk industry, natural resources, and some other genetic customer service, uh, customer products. And when the company are price, uh, price setters, they have more control over the pricing. And in other words, they can set the price to some extent. Companies are price setter when their products are unique, which results in less competition. The unique products, such as original art, jewelry, some specially manufactured machineries, patents, perfume scents, or some late latest technology computers. These are examples of some some products that the price center companies are selling. Obviously, managers would rather be the price setter than price taker. Companies try to differentiate their products in order to gain some, I mean, more controls over pricing. And they want to make their products unique in terms of features, service, or quality, or at least make the buyer think that their product is unique or somehow better. Companies achieve this differentiation partly through their advertising effort. So that's why you can see some common advertisement saying that their product is somewhat unique because saying so can make the company to be somewhere more close to be like a price setter. Target pricing. When the company is price taker, you know, it emphasizes a target pricing approach to managing the cost and profits. Target pricing starts with the market price of the product and then subtracts the company's desired profit to to determine the maximum allowed targeted a uh, target full product cost, which is the full cost to develop, produce, and deliver the product or services. Target pricing is also called target costing because the desired target cost is derived from the target price. So here is the formula. We use revenue at market price subtracts the desired profit 
we get target full product cost. In this relationship, the sales price is taken from the market. It is the amount set by the market, which is the amount, the, the maximum amount that the customers are willing to pay. The company has no control over these amounts, and the company must focus on controlling cost to obtain the desired profits. The product's full cost contains all elements from the value chain. By saying all elements, I mean both product cost and period cost, where product cost includes direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead, while period cost includes selling and administrative costs. Both of them include fixed and variable costs. If the product's co uh, current cost is higher than the target full product cost, the company must find a way to reduce the product cost or otherwise it will not meet the profit goal. Okay, here let's go back to smart test learning. We will use this example from smart test learning company to illustrate this point. Well, let's assume the company determines that the market price is $500 per tablet. And this slide shows the expected sales revenue. So from, from the expected sales revenue, we know, uh, I mean, one, uh, one million, two hundred thousands divided by the current market price, which is $500. We know the volume sold should be 2,400. Unit price times volume sold, 2,400. Because there is intense competitions, the company will emphasize a target pricing approach. Well, let's assume that the company's stockholders expect a 10% annual return on the company's assets. Or in other words, the stockholders expect a 10% ROI. So if the company has 2,500,000 uh, I mean, 2,500,000 average assets, the desired profit should be 250,000 
yeah, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. The target full product cost at the current sales volume of two thousand four hundred tablets is calculated as this slide. So this line reflects the management's expectations on the targeted revenue. It is, as I said, it is calculated as average net assets. Average net assets times the expected ROI which is 10%. That, that, uh, this is how we get the desired profit. So by this simple calculation, we know that the target full product cost should be 950,000 dollars. So our question, our current question is, can the company make and sell 2,400 tablets at a full cost to be $950,000? Well, we know from the company's contribution margin income statement Yes, we know from this slide, which is the contribution margin income statement, we know that the company's variable costs are like the $307.5, which is divided, which is calculated as This amount divided by the sales volume, 2,400 equals to like uh, 307 dollars. 50 cents. This variable cost per unit includes both manufacturing cost and selling and administrative cost. We also know that the company incurs dollars as fixed cost. Again, the fixed cost that stem from manufacturing and some of the selling and administrative activities. So in setting the regular sales price, the company should consider all of these costs. No matter it is product or period, fixed or variable, all of them.
All right. By the calculation, I mean by the by this analysis, we know that the current cost in this company is more than the targeted full product cost in order to achieve the 10% ROI. So here are some options that the company has. The first option is definitely to simply accept the lower operating income of $236,000, which results in a little bit lower return, that is 9.44% instead of 10%, which is the target return required by the stockholders. The second option is to think, think of some ways to reduce the fixed cost by $14,000 which is the difference between the target full product cost and the actual current product cost. And the third way, the third option is to reduce variable cost by this difference, $14,000 or more. Option number four is to attempt to increase the sales volume. If the company has excess manufacturing capacity, making and selling more units would only affect variable costs, but it would mean that current fixed costs are spread over more units. Option number five, is to change or add its product mix, which is a terminology that will be explained later in this chapter. Option number uh, six is to attempt to differentiate its tablet computer from the competition to gain more control over sales price. Or in other words, it's it should be think of some ways, for example, to promote its ad, uh, to modify its advertisement in order to promote the uniqueness of its current product in order to become a price setter instead of price taker. Option number seven. A combination of above strategies that would increase revenues or decrease the costs by $14,000. Well, we have discussed the case when the company is the price taker. Now, let's see the case when the company is a price setter. When the company, when the company is a price setter, it emphasizes a cost plus approach to pricing. This approach is essentially the opposite of the target pricing approach. Cost plus, cost plus, uh, Cost plus pricing starts with the company's full product cost and adds its desired profit to determine a cost plus price. As you can see, it is the basic profit calculation 
rearrange to solve for the revenue figure, which is the price. You know, as I said, when the product uh, or the service is unique, the company has more control over pricing. But in this case, the company should still needs to need to make sure that the cost pro, cost plus price is not higher than what customers are willing to pay. So again, let's go back to our smart test learning example. This time, let's assume that the, the tablet computers benefit from brand re recognition due to the company's preloaded e-learning software. So the company has some control over the price it charges for the tablets. Well, using a cost plus pricing approach, assuming the current level of sales and a desired profit of 10% of average, average assets, the cost plus price is said to be five hundred and six dollars. So let's look at this slide in detail. We start from the current variable cost, and then we plus the fixed cost. we get the full product cost. We simply plus the desired, desired profit to full product cost. We get the target revenue. We use the target revenue divided by number of tablets that the management expects to sell. Finally, we get $506 per unit. If the current market price for generic tablet computer is $500, our question is, can a smart test learning company sell its brand name tablet computers for $506 or more? I would say probably. The answer depends on how well the company has been able to differentiate its products or brand name. The company may use focus groups or marketing surveys to find out how customers would respond to its cost plus price. The company may find out that its cost plus price is too high, or it may find it could set price even higher without losing sales. So here is a quick summary. When the management needs to decide the selling price, they need to consider two cases. First, they need to focus on only relevant information. And second, 
leaning to use a contribution margin approach that separates the variable cost from fixed cost. You know, in pricing decisions, all cost information is relevant because company must cover all costs along the value chain before it can generate a profit. But we still need to consider variable costs and fixed costs separately because they behave differently at different volumes. So here's a quick summary. If the company is a price taker, it emphasizes on target pricing approach. If the company is a price setter, it should emphasize on the cost plus pricing approach. Next, let's see special pricing business decisions. A special pricing occurs when a customer requests a one-time order at a reduced sales, sales price. Again, special pricing occurs when a customer requests a one-time order at a reduced sales price. Before agreeing such special order, the management needs to consider the following three, three questions. First, the managers must consider available manufacturing capacities. If the company is already using all its existing manufacturing capacities and selling all units made at the regular sales price, it would be not profit as profitable to fill a special order at a reduced price. So available extra capacity is a necessary for accept, accepting such a special order. And this is also true for service companies as well as the manufacturing companies. Second, the second question to consider is, will the reduced price be high enough? to cover the differential cost of finding the order. Differential costs are the costs that are different if the alternative is chosen. The special price must be greater than the variable cost of finding the order or the company will incur a loss on the deal. In other words, special order must provide a positive contribution margin. Additionally, the company must consider differential fixed cost. If the company has extra capacity, fixed costs probably will not be affected by producing more units. But in some cases, management may have to incur some other fixed costs to fill the special order, such as additional insurance premiums or purchase of some special equipment. If so, they need to consider whether 
the special order sales price is high enough to generate a positive contrib contribution margin and cover the additional fixed cost. Finally, the third question that the management needs to consider is, will the special order affect regular sales in the long run? For example, they need to consider whether the other customers know this special reduced price and the and other customers will also request this reduced price and or like the will this special customer come back again and again asking the same reduced price if so in these cases the regular sales price will be effective so same thing let's consider an example from smart touch learning company normally the company sells the tablet computer for 500 dollars each let's assume that the company has offered has a special offer the customer is willing to pay $68,750 for 250 tablets, or in other words, $275, cents, uh, I mean, $275, $275 per 200 tablets instead of 500 each. This special pricing request is, is substantially less than the regular sales price. So here is our decision by looking by simply looking at the traditional format income statement showing on the left by looking at I mean the traditional format we will definitely reject this special order because the traditional format income statement shows the product cost the per unit product cost is higher than the offered special price so we use this number divided by this number we get two hundred and ninety cents uh, and ninety dollars. 83 cents this uh, I mean from the traditional formats income statements 
we get this number to be the per unit product cost, which is greater than the offered the special price offer, which is two seventy five dollars. So I said simply by looking at the tr traditional format income statement, the math the management will definitely reject this special offer. But if we look at the contribution margin format income statement, we will accept this offer. Why? Because the variable cost should be this number This number divided by two thousand four hundred, we get two forty five dollars as the product variable cost. So the special order will provide a positive contribution margin of $30 per tablet because the special order is for 250 tablets. The company's total contribution margin should increase by $7,500 if the company accepts this order. We can also use the differential analysis approach when we consider whether or not to accept this order. The company compares additional revenues from the special order with the additional expenses to see if the special order will contribute to profits. These are the amounts that will be different, be different if the order is accepted. So this slide shows the differential analysis approach. that the special order will increase revenue by $68,750. But it will also increase variable manufacturing costs by $61,250. The company's contribution margin will increase by a positive seven thousand five hundred dollars, which is the same amount as previously shown on the previous slides. The other costs shown in the on the previous slides are not relevant to the decision. Variable selling and administrative expenses will be the same whether or not the company accepts this special offer because 
the company made no special efforts to acquire the, this seal. Also, fixed manufacturing costs will not change because the company has enough idle capacity to produce these 250 extra tablets without needing additional facilities. Fixed selling and administrative expenses will not be affected by this special special order either because there are no additional fixed costs. The total increase in contribution margin flows directly to operating income. As a result, the special sales order will increase the operating income by $7,500. So here is a quick summary of such decision whether or not to accept special pricing order. If the expected increase, accepted, accept, uh, I mean the expected increase in revenue exceeds the expected increase in variable and fixed cost, the company should accept the special pricing order. And on the other hand, if the expected increase in revenue is less than the expected increase in variable and fixed cost, the company should reject the special pricing order. Okay, that's all of this class. We will continue our discussion on make the short-term business decisions about whether or not to drop a product, a product mix and sales mix in the upcoming class on Wednesday. And same thing, before I leave, please let me know if you have any other questions. No more questions? All right. Guys, I will see you on this Wednesday. See you. Thanks for your attendance. Thank you, Professor.